If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by visiting chriscarl.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find links to both Patreon and PayPal, where you can make donations. Any and all support is massively appreciated, and a huge thank you to everyone that has supported thus far. I'm getting kind of a little bit fed up with talking to people that are in incredibly warm beautiful climates they're enjoying their time with the weather they're maybe at the beach or they're they're hanging around the city in england we're currently waiting for a tropical storm to come in which is obviously ironic i'm saying tropical ironically we're just waiting to get more rain and we're still locked in so i will i will have a slight grudge against you for the duration of this podcast but it's yeah it's, i'm looking at palm trees right now and it's 70 all right well just there's, there's no need to rub it in there's no need to rub it in <laughs> So yeah, before we get to anything to do with your work, to do with film, to do with a first for the podcast, 140 episodes in, and I'm going to ask you about pre-exposed film, which is going to be very interesting. Let's start with why it is that you picked up a camera in the first place. So what made you want to become a photographer? It starts pretty early on for me. I used to snowboard and the guys where I grew up were all into Super 8 and like 35 millimeter stuff. And I mean by dumb luck of having cool influences and a community college that had a dark room still, I pretty much just copycatted the guys from my hometown and started shooting and using a dark room at maybe like 14. So it was only black and white stuff to, to start with, but that's like the origin of shooting photos for me is, is just seeing older guys do cool stuff with it. And that was mostly just shooting snowboarding stuff and nothing super cool. So what took you on from there to the point that you're at now where you're photographing uh, like editorials, athletic work? What took you from just snowboarders and, and stuff that you already sort of integrated into into stepping out into this world? Uh, when I was around 20, I moved to Portland, Oregon, which is a big art community. And I discovered color film, <laughs> you know, because I just never, I never developed it because the process was more difficult, you know, with it needing to be like 93 degrees or whatever and, and black and white's room temperature. So I just started shooting more and, and really I just kept shooting and shooting and I'm, I made connections slowly. I started more in the art world, like doing double exposures and, and, you know, like soaking film in wine. And uh, during that time I like started dating a, a girl that was a model and, and I started shooting her for like editorial stuff. And then I just started picking up jobs. So it was, it was a lot of dumb luck, but I mean, really I was shooting like every single day, maybe like six times a week for like 10 years before I got like hardcore into fashion editorial stuff. Well, I mean, you say it's dumb luck, but that seems to be the way that it actually goes for a lot of people. I feel like social media makes people think that there's all of these like incredibly succinct, easy steps that you take to find what it is that you want to do. When in actual fact, in the real world, everyone tends to sort of go ass backwards into what it is that they enjoy because most human beings don't know what's going on and what they enjoy until they find it by accident, usually. Yeah, I mean, that's the truth. And and I mean, like, it was a long process to find even what parts of photography I like. And, And even still to this day, I'll rotate through different things in photography to to stay focused. I'll go from black and white to color to double exposures to soak film to like fashion looks with 20 layers and then I'll shoot like naked people. It's just, <laughs> you know, all over the place. Is that like a, a way of keeping you interested? Do you feel like if you didn't do that, you would actually sort of go off of photography in a way? I feel like photography is, is complex for me in the fact that uh, I don't think I'm shooting for an end product, but more of an experience. I, I like good photos, but Photography for me is is like a way to get out of the house and travel places and like meet new people and work on projects because I, I don't I, <laughs> I don't think I'd necessarily be out of the house that much if I wasn't doing it and it's I mean it's a <laughs> it's less of a hobby now for me and more of a lifestyle to to like maintain some discipline and and like get out and have reasons to get out. I mean, you mentioned obviously starting off with film. And in the last 20 years, photography's gone through a hell of an evolution. Some would say a devolution in some cases with with some of the work that's being produced now because cameras are becoming so idiot-proof. But 
what is it that makes you stick with film and not, you know, move over to the high spec stuff that YouTubers love to tell you to buy? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't feel like digital has any feeling to it unless you're good at post process. And for me, that's just tedious and I don't get any enjoyment out of it. I've actually never shot digital. I've probably only done digital on two of my jobs ever. (laughs) And I have a lot of jobs. So I, I feel like I've been able to talk people into understanding like that they want film and film just looks better. And I think even the people that shoot digital edit their photos to emulate film. Right. (laughs) You know, they're, they're, they're spending $5,000 on a body and $3,000 on a lens to emulate a $30 camera. (laughs) And you know, like you can skip all that, you know, if you just know how to shoot a camera, like you said, you know, idiot proof, there's, there's, there's something that comes from learning, you know, how to use a camera, not on auto and what you get out of it is so much more satisfying, even if there is deficiencies. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that like necessarily digital as a medium is a bad thing or that film as a medium is necessarily a good thing. It's just the case that, like you said, it's really funny the way the tide flows that people buy a a camera that has this like unbelievable high spec megapixels and sharpness and then they buy a filter to put on the front so that it takes away some of that sharpness and it takes away some of that, that detail so that it can emulate film. And then they put it into a computer and they put on presets that they've paid a fortune for to make it look like film. It's just, it's a really, human beings are a fascinating breed. Aren't they? Yeah. I mean, if you shoot digital, I mean, if I do for a job, people want my stuff to still look like my film. So if I shot a digital photo, I'd have to take the contrast way down and add grain. And it's immediately like, it just, I don't, you know, it's just a silly thing. With digital, obviously, I think a lot of people, and I I use the word idiot proof, so I'll definitely attribute that to me. They they like the fact that it's kind of got a lot of safety nets involved. You can see what you're doing as you do it. You've got an, an unbelievable amount of photos to take. And now with like the the frames per second that they can shoot and things like that, it's it's gotten to the point of of being almost easy, depending on what it is that you're trying to do. Um, do you think that the thing that puts people off a film is like the trap door of having to actually have that knowledge to reinforce and, and the confidence in your knowledge to reinforce your ability? Uh, well, I think there's a couple of reasons. I think one clients usually are people that are in their forties and fifties and they saw digital come into the picture and made everything cheaper. And like you said, like idiot proof, less likely to fail. So I think there's like a weird, uh, uh, you know, thing going on with clients not liking film just because they think it's dated or vintage or whatever. But as, as people from the nineties and the two thousands enter into creative jobs, like creative director jobs, they're, they're interested in it and they're excited about it. And I get, I get jobs because solely I shoot film, which I mean, 10 years ago, that was probably weird. (laughs) Right. What do you make of the people that are coming into film from, from digital? So the ones that have obviously like in the last 10 years, maybe have picked up a camera they bought their first DSLR, they learned what they were taught on YouTube. And then with the pickup of the popularity of film, do you feel like that's a negative or a positive? Is it something that like, it obviously is stirring some companies to produce more film, you know, Kodak obviously changed quite a lot with their pricing, but they have upped the scale of their production is the kind of, I don't want to say hipster movement because it sounds like I'm taking a shit on people. And I am one of those people that has picked up film retroactively. But, but is it a, is it a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a good thing. I mean, everybody has to start somewhere. And I hope the companies that stayed in and the labs that stayed in through the tough time, like reap the benefit of not giving up on the medium and the art. Like I'm, I'm, you know, like you may not love everything Kodak does or your local lab might be too expensive, but I mean, those guys gutted it out for 25 years, maybe of poor sales and, not that many people getting their film process. So I hope they're doing well when it comes to people jumping in. Of course, it's frustrating because I use film stock that have basically disappeared because I don't know, whatever photographers have made them cool. And that's frustrating that I can't just use my $3 roll of film anymore. That's $10 now, or just doesn't <laughs> exist. But it, it's hard to, you know, look at people and say that you're upset that they're excited about shooting 
photos, you know, even when it comes to film, like if your director is using, you know, 35 millimeter or 60 millimeter, it's going to look better than shooting it on 6k or 8k or whatever they do it on now. And, and you just feel like they're more in tune with the art and the medium. And i so I respect anybody that's willing to jump over it. Let's get let's get to you. We've picked on hipsters now, so let's get to you. A really annoying question that everybody really dislikes, but I, I do like to kind of to ask it to c- sort of coax out certain things. How would you describe your style of photography? Man, that's tough. I, I feel like <laughs> I have like an undeniable aesthetic, but it's not something that I've ever focused on. You know, it just like came out and is what it is. I'm very square. I use a lot of colors. I hate green though. So I avoid a lot of green, (laughs) you know? And as far as the art stuff, I feel like it's a controlled chaos. Like when I'm doing doubles and soaking stuff, I don't think, I mean, not to sound arrogant, but I don't think anybody's as controlled as me when it comes to those things. I have like a science and I understand like how it works and it always works for me. But, uh, (laughs) you know, as far as fashion goes, it's just, it's very, uh, square and I follow lines pretty well. And I don't, I, I don't know. It's difficult to describe things past technical stuff. Well, I think if you're going to be, um, sort of analyzed from the outside, I definitely see, um, similar elements to what you saw from like Testino and Maisel in the nineties. And you actually really remind me, and I don't know if it's necessarily aesthetic, but maybe just mood. And I sound pretentious, but I'm not. You remind me quite a bit of Corinne Day with this kind of, it's sort of the expression is so much more important. One thing that I think is really missing with fashion photography in the most part at the moment is that it's becoming clinical and moodless and it's becoming very clean and everything's retouched to death, but there's just not much expression. We've removed the human element from it. And I think the 90s really was when that came to a, to a head and it started to look fantastic. You had great expressive you know, the era of the supermodels, they had to be expressive. They had to have lots of life to them. And now I feel like with influencers, we're kind of going in the complete opposite direction. How does it, how does it come about sort of developing your style? You said it was organic, but, but what were your early influences? You know, it's, it's funny because I don't feel like I ever like looked at a photographer and said I wanted to emulate them. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until like maybe the last five years where I was like, oh, I really like that. But even if I liked a photographer, I feel like I couldn't emulate it. But I mean, Growing up, I really liked like Helmut Newton stuff. Um, I like it's just that they're okay with the rawness, right? And and a little bit of like things being imp- imperfect. I feel like we're so focused now on things being perfect that the feeling of the photos is just not there. I, I don't know if you look through old photo books and you just like you're surprised that a photo's in the book, right? Cause you're like, yeah. it's weird. It's out of focus. This part's soft. The expression is, it's funky, but like, I don't know. I bet that we're so <laughs> controlled now. Maybe that's the issue. Yeah. And no, I think like modern movies, it's not, it's not literally just photography, but you see it with modern movies, modern TV. The, the, the important thing for everything is that it's like everyone it is posing. It's not. That, exactly. you, know, you don't get those Jack Nicholson, you can't handle the truth moments, which was off script. You don't get that if you make everyone stick exactly to the script and you make everything clean and clinical, you get those really amazing um, human moments. And like you, the out of focus, the slightly out of focus photo might have the best expression. And it's interesting how people see those priorities. Like now the priority just seems to be technical, whereas the priority used to be human. It used to be about emotion. And I guess with you, what's your main priority with your work? Is it expression, lighting, styling? Well, uh, styling is important and the lighting is important. I always shoot direct sunlight and I, I think a lot of people avoid that. So I'm a big on shadows and having like no shadows on faces, like the under eye shadows or the nose shadow. Uh, that's a huge focus about me. Uh, but I always like to shoot outside, but it, it's really, I, I feel like the higher you get up and the tears of, uh, you know, working with models, the more the photos start representing the models because they should have their own personalities. You know, you bring them to a location and you uh, have a stylist and a makeup artist and you set everything up. You're just hoping that they can give you something. You're just like, use this space, lean on this or do whatever, you know, and it should be their personality coming out. I, I get frustrated if you go back tears and you have to 
to direct people because I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of directing people. I mean, what's that like for you? And then if you're not enjoying it and you're on a shoot and someone's just not giving you much, <laughs> what was was your go to with that? You know, I just I just get through it. I I finish whatever, and if it's a job, I you know I just do my best. And, and just, to you know, put it into perspective, it would be like if you got a a job in a movie and you were supposed to show up to set and they, they had the set, the director gave you the lines, you were styled and everything. And then you look at the director and you go like, how am I supposed to read this? The director is going to look at you and be like, are you kidding? Like we built right. everything for you. You just have to put in your 20%. <laughs> you know, and then I hope they can do that. Do you feel like maybe... I mean, I mentioned influencers earlier. Do you feel like people being so used to photographing themselves has left them in a position of not really knowing how to actually model? Do you feel like we're losing the art? Yeah, it's it's strange because I feel like the amount of time that people that like being in photos spend in front of the mirror and how they act in front of you is so different. Because I'll, I'll work with people that have like a huge presence online and they look comfortable and then they'll stand in front of the camera and they look like a deer in the headlights. And I think it's just because they don't have any control of how they look. And they probably tweak a lot of stuff. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an awkward thing. In terms of directing, I know you, obviously you don't want to direct, but in terms of like the direction that you want to take things to bring the idea to life, do you just give them moods and you just tell them to work off of a certain mood? Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean I, it sounds cliche, but, but I'm not the photographer that's like, act like this, but I'm, you know, I'll show up in a spot and I'm just say, I want you to look, you know, bored, <laughs> you know? Just, uh, the, or like, you know, like the Gucci mannequin look where you just stare off into space, like the square feeling, things like that. I'll give them like a mood that they should embody. And, and past that, I want them just to be themselves. One of the things that I've struggled with photographing with film, having learned on digital is quite often I would use dead frames to, to work, a, a, work a model into what I'm looking for. So I've always found that it's quite difficult to say to someone like, no, that's not working. Cause I feel like early on, it felt like I was killing their confidence and their trust. And I would sort of shoot through ideas and just coax them away from it. But with film, that's an incredibly expensive thing to do. So if it's not exactly what you, if it's not working or not exactly, it means that there's a, there's only one way it can be done. But if it's not exactly going the way that you want it to, how do you coax them, but maintain that, that trust? I, there's a, there's a photographer that worked at milk studios in the nineties that told me that all the guys in the studio would shoot a fake roll of film with the first look just to get people comfortable. <laughs> so I think building, <laughs> you know, building the energy is helpful. I don't think you can ask somebody to give everything or feel completely comfortable on the first look. So, I mean, personally, I'll, I'll shoot like, my least favorite look or I'll work on something that's not the focus to start so that there's a little bit of buildup. And I'm okay with telling people that like, it's not looking great. And I'm also okay with being like, Hey, let's take like five minutes, you know, and, and like, just, you know, relax. So I don't, I feel like I'm pretty good at communicating, but like you said, like sometimes you have to just shoot a roll for no reason, <laughs> which is not ideal. But it is realistic. One of the most important parts of photographing people is what's done before you pick up the camera. And I actually have found from doing this, it's very similar with a podcast. Like there's, there's sometimes where someone wants to talk for an hour before you start the podcast. And there's other times where people are like, the moment they pick up the call, they want to get rolling. How do you go about that pre-shooting stage of, of what you're doing? Do you go through the concept of them and go through the idea? Do you have a coffee with them and talk about, you know, the world that we live in, which is probably a depressing subject or, or what do you do? <laughs> yeah, I'd say, well, for jobs, you know, they give you the deck, you talk to the art directors, they kind of give you a feel of things and you don't, you, you know, you just show up for fun stuff. I mostly go through agencies where I write an agent and I say like, who's on the board this week that fits this? And they'll give me a face and I'll talk to the agent. I'll pitch whatever I need to pitch. And the model really just shows up and you hope they have a good personality and you hope that they're, you know, comfortable with everything. And it's mostly just small talk on the professional level. And then maybe, you know, during that first shoot is almost an audition to test with them in the future. So you, you, you just never know what you're going to get. And you hope that you bond a little bit when you're shooting and maybe you set up 
a second or third thing. But for the most part, it's just a, a one-off thing in LA, you know, talk to the agent, don't ever talk to the model. They show up, you work with them and that's it. I mean, you mentioned an art director there and for people like myself that aren't in, in that world, I'd say yet, yeah, but I, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be in that world of, of having someone directing my, my work in that sense. What's it like handing over that creative control? I feel like most art directors are hiring you because they like your aesthetic and they trust you and you're making them look good or bad. And I don't feel like an art director usually steps in with your process unless they see something that like is catastrophic. I haven't had any issues with them, but mostly it's just somebody standing over your back every once in a while going like, that's too dark. That's too light. What do you think about this? Which is annoying because you know, if you're hiring somebody for their aesthetic and their knowledge, you just like let them go because it's going to look better. <laughs> so right. that's really where, you know, they're not really butting in too much. And with regards to your personal work, I mean, the styling is something that really jumps out at me. Like I said, I see the current day influence, but then she was literally living in a completely different century, actually, at that point with the work that I kind of see the influence. What's your styling influence? Where, where's that coming from? Man, really? It's just the connections that I make with stylists around and I try to find people that are like-minded and I guess my stuff evolves, but usually I'm into stuff in different periods and I'm into uh, not so much like contemporary fashion, but yeah, definitely like a vintage fashion. And I like softer, more feminine stuff for the most part, even if I'm shooting with male models. Um, Yeah, I don't know. Because LA's got this normal styling in LA is like bo bohemian and it's very vanilla and kind of funky. Like I just don't want it to feel like an everyday look. I guess that's the biggest part. I don't want it to ever feel like I'm shooting something that you would see on the street or, or just something basic. I want it to be somewhat memorable. Well, do you know, it's something that's come up recently and having the opportunity to talk to, I think, about 120 different photographers over the course of the last year and a half has been eye-opening to say the least. And I always had portraits and fashion were kind of separated by expression. That was how it always was in my mind. But as I've become more and more, well, I've been pushed more and more into the deep of the fashion world and seen uh, the way that the, the process works for a lot of fashion photographers, I can see that expression isn't something that's mutual, uh, mutually exclusive to um, only or exclusive only to portraiture and, and has nothing to do with fashion. It's just that seems to be the current trend with fashion, which is a bit sad. So what is actually the difference between a, a fashion image and a, a portrait? Fashion, you're usually involving like a team, I feel like. And on a portrait, I feel like maybe you're just using a makeup artist and you can have really cool portrait stuff, but I don't shoot a ton of beauty things. Portrait more like in my brain. I don't know if there's a, difference on your side of the pond, but portrait to me is just upper body face stuff. And I get maybe like one or two of those out of like a set. So it feels cohesive, but I shoot personally, like really wide. I always want to be wider. I don't think my stuff like translate that great to a small screen because I just want to shoot it wide. It would look great big. (laughs) So I don't shoot tight very often. Well, I feel like it's not even just a this side of the pond situation. It feels like if you just go from one person to the next, there seems to be varying degrees of the interpretation of the words. But let's, let's stick with your with your work and your subject choice. This is something I've always found fascinating because I feel like people really do approach this differently. I always used to look at, if someone approached to work with me, I would look at their portfolio, or if I was even looking for someone to work with, I'd look at their portfolio, I'd look at some of their images and I'd see what they're doing with their hands. Because I always feel like hands tell you how comfortable someone is in front of a camera. I, I recently was told by a podcast guest that that makes me sound like a serial killer, which is slightly terrifying. <laughs> I don't think you're crazy. What's your sort of process for picking uh, or deciding on the models that you're going to work with? And at what stage is that decision made? For, first off, though, going back to your hands thing, if, if somebody's on set and they don't know what they do with their hands, that's the most frustrating thing ever for me. And it's a sure tell mm-hmm. sign of them, them, them not being comfortable and probably being pretty raw with modeling. <laughs> so that's, that's very frustrating. And I don't think you're crazy for thinking about it. For me picking, I just, you know, write the agent, they'll send me a board of 10 people. And I'm just trying to find somebody that looks interesting. That is a person I don't normally work with. 
So I don't know. I just like recently in my last 10, whatever editorials, I've tried to pick somebody that doesn't look like one of those people. And I'm not looking at uh, followers or, or anything. I'm just looking at their book to see if they can make like good faces. If they have different faces, if I go to somebody's book and they have, you know, 12 photos in it and all of their faces are exactly the same. I'm worried that they're not going to be able to get that much, you know, going. So I, I go through people that can play different characters and I, and I'm looking for people that are okay with playing different characters. In that sense, is it better to look outside of modeling given the sort of aforementioned streak of, you know, the problem with influencers where you could go to like a theater or you could go look down the route of actors or theater workers and find people that are much more used to, like you say, playing a character as opposed to just have a selection of poses that they do in front of their mirror. Yeah. I mean, it's tough for everybody. I don't know about you, but when I shoot, like I seem to have like a routine that's difficult to break. Sometimes I wish I could think out of, outside of myself or like unlearn why I'm doing what I'm doing. Cause I could go to any spot and shoot the same thing. I'm hoping that the model isn't like that, you know, even if I am. And uh, one last question on this subject, and then I, I promise we'll, we'll move away from the other people involved and we'll go back to you. But I had something said to me recently, which I, I found really kind of fascinating. And it sat with me for a while in, in a private conversation, but I, you know, I'm not divulging who it was. The, a photographer said to me that they wanted to start looking to photograph uh, a more diverse range of people because it's going to be commercially viable to have a more diverse range of people in their portfolio, which I, I definitely can see the truth in that statement. Is someone photographing for the sake of diversity for how it makes them look a good thing? It, yeah. you know, does the ends justify the means? Yeah. So, I mean, personally, I feel like I just want to shoot people that are good at modeling really, or look good styled. And, and I've never like picked people based on diversity. I also think just shooting somebody to fit a check mark to make it look diverse is, right. is, you know, is not a great way to look at things. Look, if somebody's talented or somebody, you know, is great, then you're shooting them at, you know, like, that's great. <laughs> you know, you should be aiming to find people that are interesting and talented, but you know, we're in that weird intersection of like how things are working right now and giving other people an opportunity also isn't a bad thing. I just don't want to have to coach somebody through something. So I'm not going to find somebody and be like, Oh, you're diverse and interesting, but you have no, you know, experience. Right. And I have to coach you all the way through it. Like that's not something I'm looking for. Yeah. I mean, I just, to me, I, I, I sat with it for a couple of days and I kind of reverse engineered it by thinking, okay, well, if you're saying that you now sort of need to photograph people of a certain, I really don't like the word, but you know, I, I've, I've done 140 podcasts. I'm running out of words. If you're looking to, to photograph someone that's a different type, that to me tells me that previously you were intentionally not. And it's just, it's an interesting sort of uh, an unintended consequence of you know, the rotation of society, it just, I find it fascinating because essentially it's going to lead to people being given an opportunity that they wouldn't have been given previously. But at the same time, the motivation behind it isn't maybe great. So, you know, it's one of those really weird things. Like, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Yeah. I mean, and, and agencies, people have, you know, people think of agencies as pretty negative places. They're telling people that they have to look a certain way for them to sell them. And, and the truth with agencies is, you know, they really don't care what your look, what you look like at all. They want to sell you. And if they're making money off your look, they'll do it. So they're not necessarily gatekeeping. Like it's a societal issue. If there was a certain type of person that was selling, like you guaranteed the agencies would only have that person. It just right. feels like for too long, it was white, skinny, blonde girls. And I think that is changing. And I think a lot of people are happy about that. Maybe not white, skinny, blonde girls because it's getting harder to book more jobs, but it's becoming more inclusive, baby step wise. And you'll start see, seeing more diversity on boards, which is great for everybody. But I think like seeking those people out, you know, just to have check marks on your resume or your portfolio is kind of a gross thing. You mentioned there about not wanting to coach people through when you're trying to get a job done, when, you know, when you're trying to do what you do. And I've said for years that no matter how many people you have involved in a creative project when it comes to photography, when it, when it comes down to photographing another person, it's, it's two people. It's the person taking the picture and it's the person that's getting in the way of the camera. 
and they're, they're sharing 50% of the work at that moment. And if the model comes in or the photographer comes in and they don't know how to do their job sufficiently, one is going to have to help the other one, which means they're going to be lifting more weight, which is ultimately going to drag the whole thing down. Does having a big team around you make your job any easier if you're working with someone that's not the most skilled model? Yeah, I feel like sometimes there's somebody on set that's excited or sees it through a different lens. That's like, hey, you can stand like this or you can pose like this. And those things are helpful. I mean, and I, what I'm talking about coaching, I'm talking about somebody that just stands there, has one pose, and then they do like a power stance. And then, you know, they're, <laughs> they're just standing there and you feel like you have to coach everything. It, that's the frustrating thing. Not if it's like a 60-40 thing, you know, and they, and they mostly know and there's a framework to their stuff. And you, there's a little bit of synergy that you can add to help them. I'm just talking about if somebody does a power stance and then they're going, what do I do with my hands? You know, when it gets to what do I do with my hands? You're just like, man, there's no hope here, is there? (laughs) One of the things I found through wedding photography is that it's extremely difficult to make someone look their best when they're showing you their worst in terms of like their attitude. Or if you just, if, if you're not getting on, it's really hard to push through. And, and uh, there's a photographer who I think is, the, the best wedding photographer in the world I had on the podcast a while back. I went to one of his workshops and one of the things he said was, you just have to teach yourself to love people if you don't, even if you don't want to. And that's how you get through a wedding day is, is, which is probably a terrible thing if you remove the concept of photography from it. But the idea being that, you know, no matter how much someone is maybe not being someone that you're on a, on a good, um, a good level with emotionally, it's, a, it's a good way to sort of trick yourself into being like that so that the photos come out better so that you enjoy the job more is it ever an issue for what you're doing if you and and the subject just aren't clicking uh you know there's some people that are just it's just not going to work with but it's pretty rare and few in between that, that that happens and it's a bummer when it does but usually it's not for lack of effort from my side but some people are just having a bad day or you know I, whatever preconceived notions about how you look or something and they're just not into it I don't know if you know who Ryan Muirhead is, but he's a good yeah. friend of mine. And he, he does a great job just bearing his insecurities and being super open. And I think like, he, he can make anybody feel comfortable. So I think just, you know, being open and, and showing that you're not like, uh, I don't know, just having personality is helpful. But the fact that he's, you know, like, Hey, I'm not good at this, or this makes me feel weird. And, and he, but then gets excited about it when he starts shooting, like it just makes people feel comfortable. And so people that are good at conversation, like conversation usually don't have any issues. The issues come when you have somebody that's like very quiet and it's hard to break them out of their shell. And you've got to separate from their phones as well, which is always fun. I- interestingly <laughs> they enough. They take them away on sets now. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. That's, that's literally the best thing ever because that's something that's like, I find it just infuriating. And I, I'm always amazed when people don't think they're being rude. But uh, regardless, let's, let's stick with some positives now because I'm, I'm, I'm English. I tend to be pessimistic. I've been into it. It's January in England. So we're in our 300th month of winter. So I'm just, um, I'm trying to be, I'll try and be positive. Um, I actually have firsthand experience this week. A, a photographer that introduced me to your work is uh, Colin Ferres. And um, I have firsthand experience this week on a Zoom call with him of seeing his expression when he got his scans back from someone and he got to see his images and I got to see his face light up. And it was like, I don't want to make fun of him too much, but it was like a little bit of a giddy school child. It was pretty great. Oh, I love that guy. He's great. In terms of the process, like the, the planning, the conceptualizing, the being on set and shooting, the um, I don't know if you do your own developing or if you send them off, but what stage of the actual process of image creating it does the most for you, gives you the most joy? Okay, well, work just all together is stressful. I don't really like any part of it. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're asked to deliver, you know, and, and like people are like, what's the, you know, date that I'm getting all this stuff back? So we'll just, that stuff's stressful. But for me, creating on my own, which I do a lot of, um, there's a lot of chaos really. And in, I don't make huge plans unless I'm shooting with like people that need structure, but I'm really not a structure person. I'm just like, Hey, it's going to be nice tomorrow. I'll go pull looks from a stylist and like, let's go to the desert. That's really the fun part for me is just going. 
Mm -hmm. And I don't need structure and I don't, I don't need like a bunch of stuff, you know, and I used to have a lab do my stuff in like 30 minutes back in Portland. Now I have a great film guy out in Southern California, but it takes a week for me to get my stuff back. So I've like learned to just chill, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> give somebody 12 rolls and I just wait, you know, eight or 10 days. Like eh, it's <laughs> that part, you know, it's fun when you get it, but really it's, it's just going out with people and doing something. That's the fun part for me. So something that maybe people that have listened to, I think probably every podcast would know, but most people won't realize that my name actually isn't Chris Carl. That's not my full name. Uh, my last name is incredibly difficult to pronounce and spell. And I removed it from my, my business side of things because I wanted to save people the trouble. Um, and incidentally, now everyone calls me Carl, which is incredibly frustrating. <laughs> I wasn't blessed with a name that was particularly useful when it comes to advertising yourself in that way. Your name is Chase Hart, which honestly sounds like a movie star from the 70s. How did you land on myfridayfilms.com when you've got such a cool name? Oh, uh, so I've, I've never been a big fan of uh, being in the spotlight. I don't really like when people look at me kind of like in when I'm shooting. I just, it's stressful for me. And like putting my names on, on things, it, it feels funky. And when I was younger, I was obsessed with Akira. So I used to write like Fried in Love on stuff. And I was filming snowboard movies literally when I was like 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I did that as a career until I was like 20. And I would just write Friday films on stuff so I could just make a brand that, you know, so people didn't know what I looked like, whatever. It was, it was kind of nice, but that's the reasoning for that. And so I mentioned at the beginning and I'm going to leave it to you to explain how this works because I'm neither technical enough, nor is it really about me for me to be doing this, but what are pre-exposed films? So pre-exposed is you know, things that I'm selling usually a pre-exposed role is when I shoot the role and I roll it back and I send it to somebody. So it's the first part of a double exposure, but it's was popular on, on my page for a long time. I, you know, people get excited about it. I shoot a lot of double exposures and I think people want to be a part of that process. And it's just like a cool way to, I don't know, like combined, it's like sending somebody an art role and letting them finish it. And I think that's fun. I don't know if you shoot double exposures ever. Uh, not on film yet. No, but I, I'm in England. I haven't done photography for about 12 months. I'm going insane. But when you're doing that, when you're doing those pre-exposed roles, how do you, like, are you, are you like underexposing by a certain amount so that it, it sort of bleeds through without over, over, overpowering what they want to do? I just have a specific time that I shoot it. And I just say, I only shoot it in like a very specific light, which is usually like a late day light. And I try to shoot it on like 3.5 f-stop, you know, so it's consistent. But um, I'm, I'm measuring proper for the most part. I might overexpose like a shade, but for the most part, I'm just shooting exactly how it's meant to be. And I'll, <laughs> I don't know why people have issues with it, but you know, I, I can shoot a bunch of them and they all come out exactly the same way. So we're speaking about, I think it's about a week on from Fujifilm's big horrendous earth shattering announcement that 400H is going out of production um, and it's disappearing off the face of the earth, which means it's going to go up in price on eBay exponentially. One of the things that I kind of noticed from that and, and coming into, I, I bought, I've had film cameras for, for years now, but I bought my first medium format mid 2020 to kind of start to get? teach myself. I had a, a Bronecker ETRS, just a 645. So I had lots of chance to practice. Basically, I wasn't. I love a 645 though. I, I, I was told by one person that it doesn't count as medium format, which is kind of a good lead into what I'm getting to here. So one of the things that I was told so much of when I, with the podcast and when I was looking at getting into medium format film was about this film community and, and the film community is so, so wonderful. You know, everyone's always willing to help each other out and so on. And Something that I did notice with this Fuji 400, and it's the first time I've been mentally involved with film, and this has happened where a film stock has gone out of production. One thing I did notice was that a lot of people that have never shot 400H, even self-admittedly not, not shot 400H, were posting as soon as they got the news or as soon as they saw it about what a tragedy it was and that they were going to immediately go out and buy some and they were going to shoot it for the first time and 
they were sharing it on stories, they were sharing it on Instagram posts. It was, it was being shared more by people than it was by the actual photographic industry. And one of the things that I said at the time, and I think actually Carl mocked me a bit for it, was that what people are doing is speeding up the process of that film disappearing or the price hike for people that actually used it for the sake of a little bit of Captain Subtext just saying, hey, I shoot film. Right. Yeah. No, I feel like that's always been a thing. And I, I mean, I've been, I'm, I'm only 30 years old, but I've seen a lot of stocks go out and I feel like there's a part of the community that's more obsessed with gear and stuff than they are with actually shooting. And for somebody to have a box of, you know, 400 H in their freezer for 20 years is exciting to them for some weird collector reason, <laughs> you know, and and a lot of people come out and do that. That's not my thing. And I've never really been a big fan of, of Fuji stuff because it's a little too punchy for me. But yeah, I mean, those are the gear people mostly. Shout out to the gear people for running up all the prices for us. <laughs> well, yeah, I think um I think I'm I'm seeing more and more of it now that now that I'm involved in the community a bit more by talking to so many people, I'm learning more and more about some of the weird uh, foibles, I guess, of, of people that are involved in different mediums. I mean, I've seen it with music in the past and I, uh, years ago was a chef and you could see certain weird attributes. If you've never worked in a kitchen, you never see from chefs. So I guess it's just kind of a little bit of a, a peek behind the curtains, but I just thought it was really interesting that people were so concerned with making sure that everyone knew that they shoot film through some kind of bullshit subtext that they were actually causing more of a problem for the thing that they were talking about. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are probably so bummed that 400 H is just completely gone because they shoot it every week. And now some guy, you know, in New York bought 50 packs of it and he'll put it in his freezer <laughs> and he'll sell it in 10 years. Exactly. Ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. A, a really massive thanks for you taking the time to do this. I promise I'll let you go soon. I know it's, it's very draining. I'm in no rush. I'm enjoying this. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, you also do some athletic work I've noticed on your site. Is that entirely commercial? Or is that something that you find interesting as well? Well, I was living in Portland, Oregon, which is the headquarters of Nike and Adidas and Under Armour and Columbia. So that, that's like side stuff to make some money, honestly, just to leave in my portfolio. I'm not a big fan of athletic stuff or athleisure. It's not really a fun thing to shoot, but to be fair, the groups in the streetwear athleisure kind of area they have had a lot of respect for the film community in the last few years i feel like for whatever reason that niche of fashion are are really interested in me shooting like super eight or you know, bringing a film camera around and i've been getting jobs just shooting film with them and i so you know i don't want to dump on them i have a lot of respect for for them because they seem to respect the mediums i mean you mentioned super eight there and for people that think that Super 8 is a filter on Instagram. Uh, what's the process of shooting <laughs> Super 8 like? You would be surprised with how crazy it's been lately. I've been getting lots of music video jobs in LA with Super 8, but honestly, uh, it's hard finding reels sometimes. I, I think I bought every reel in LA this last week because I had three jobs back to back and all I could find in the whole city was like 12 reels. I bought them all at once. And never ever did I think I would be buying, I don't know, a thousand dollars in in Super Eight film at once, so that's crazy. That's what it's like in twenty one, I guess. But I mean, <laughs> I have a decent camera, <laughs> you know, and they're only like two hundred and fifty dollars. And you throw it in there, you measure light well, and you know it doesn't have a microphone usually. And you set it in just like you send in thirty five millimeter film, but it's a blast and it looks great, and people really love the feel. You mentioned it for music videos. If I can actually just ask a really stupid question, because I don't know anything about video to that extent, and I yeah. definitely don't know anything about Super 8. Is there any syncing issues with the like frame rate compared to when you're, if you're getting anyone to kind of mime with their music? Well, you can shoot Super 8 from 12 frames a second to 24 frames a second. 24 is a little draggy, I think, but it's fairly modern frame rate. And a lot of people that I'm shooting with are letting me shoot whatever, you know, story I want to. And it's less uh, band focused with them, like singing or anything. So really, I'm just doing whatever fun work I want. And they're just slapping their song over it. All right. So you've mentioned Portland, you've mentioned California. What is it about the West side of the United States that has so many artistic communities? Well, the Southern California 
is massive <laughs> when it comes to just people and access to sun and film and creatives and models and whatnot. It, it just feels like, I don't know, it could have been anywhere, but LA is just where everybody is. So when you're in LA, you just have access to whatever you need. And it's great because I don't particularly like Southern California, but every time I'm here, if I want to build something or shoot something, it's, you know, it's right here. Everything you need. There's no other city where I could just, you know, drive around for 30 minutes and collect 12 reels of super eight in 2021. There just isn't. So it's, it's a, it's a great resource. A lot of people like to think that they are kind of a really, um, I've got, I'm trying to not make this sound like a negative because I turn everything into a negative and I'm trying my best not to. But a lot of people like to think that they are not affected by their environment as much as what they are, in, in all fairness. And a lot of people like to think that they are this incredibly strong character that wherever you sort of plot them on the planet, they would be that person. But if you were to not have been somewhere in you know, with the United States, the West Coast of the United States, with the, like you mentioned, the sun, the good weather, if you were to not been there, if you would have been, let's say, in London, which is still culturally relevant, do you feel like you would be the same photographer? And not necessarily am I saying the same work, because the idea of direct sunlight is is almost like a mythological thing in England. But <laughs> <laughs> sure uh, I mean, I spent I spent like eight years in Portland, eight years in Portland. I think Portland's got the same weather as London. The only difference is you can drive in the states pretty easy to the sun. I'm not sure that you're driving to Ibiza every week to shoot in the sun. <laughs> you and Carl both say Ibiza. <laughs> What's well, a joke? In America, we just assume that British people only have spring break in Ibiza. Uh, so it used to be Ibiza. It's now, uh, I mean, Magaluf is pretty much more. We tend to, what we do is, British people tend to just randomly cycle a Spanish island every couple of years, wreck it, make everyone there hate the English, and then we move on to the next island. Uh, I didn't even know what island you're on. I, I think Carl likes Ibiza because he's been out there. I think he shot with Ryan Muirhead out there. Got right. Cool architecture. And I do love Spanish architecture. I mean, you mentioned Ryan Muirhead and obviously um, Carl's mentioned previously Jan Schultz and both phenomenal film photographers in, in their own right. And they both have very contrasting styles in terms of their personalities, but they both produce amazing work. How much of... I mean, you mentioned kind of disassociating yourself a little bit by using Friday films as opposed to having your name be front and center. How much of you as a photographer is a character that you put on when you're working and then you're a different person when you get home? I'd like to think that I'm the same person, really. I, you know, I mean, maybe other people could be like, no, nah. <laughs> but, you know, for the most part, I'm pretty transparent with, with myself. And I'm, I'm just naturally a, like a shy person that just, doesn't like the attention. I feel like I'm not the person to have galleries because I don't want, I feel like it, you, you putting yourself out there is such like a me, me, me thing. I'm not interested in it. If somebody were to like ask me to send stuff for a gallery, I'd send it to them, but I wouldn't show up and watch people critique my stuff. Just the same. I just, I just, the name isn't important to the photography. I'd like people to judge my work off my work and not so much my name. And I think disassociating that a little bit makes it easier to do so. I mean, you mentioned critique there, and that's something that the internet has managed to bring us an abundance of. Um, I'm, I'm personally not a particularly big fan of unsolicited critique from other artists. I don't, I'm not a big fan of people that, I mean, in England, they tend to be people that spend their weekends in village halls looking at pictures of insects that other people have taken in their garden and then trying their best to hurt each other's feelings <laughs> through passive aggression. When it comes to sort of self-critique, though, I think that's really where you see the difference in personalities with people. How do you go about judging your own work? And are you someone that goes through phases of just not liking it? Yeah, I mean, I'm always tough on my stuff. And it, it, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'd be more worried with people that look at the work and go like, this is amazing. I can't do any better. <laughs> that person can't be trusted, can they? That's too positive for me. And you probably understand being from England. I always want to get out and do better and figure things out. And I, I might see other people's work that I'm, that I enjoy. I don't know. Sometimes I look at my stuff and I go, am I good? Am I cheesy? I don't even know if I'm corny or not. It's hard to tell. I know that I'm not always happy with my work, but I don't share a ton of it. I think I share less and less now. And then obviously that, that means your, your last phase of self-editing is is publication, what you're actually letting people see. So 
I mean, it's hard to put a number on things, but in terms of the, the work that you produce, how much of it sees the light of day? Probably like 10% at best. You know, I, I, pre-pandemic, I was shooting six times a week. During the pandemic, I probably get one or two things a week. You know, and I mean, like, we'll just take Instagram. I, I feel like I used to post like five or six times a week of photos. Right now, I probably post like twice a month. Where I'm just like, meh, you know, like, like is, is it, I think we got consumed a little bit on uh, social media and like having to keep up with a pace that's unrealistic it, in a sense that like, you know, our photos now are probably better than, you know, famous photographers in the, you know, 25, 30 years ago, even, you know, we shoot so much and we're so desensitized to good work. And when I'm putting stuff out now, I'm like, is this good? You know, like compared to like myself, am I liking this? Or is this just content that I'm posting to just be relevant for some dopamine or something? And it, and it, <laughs> it just recently I've decided, you know, like maybe I don't need to be so connected to that and I can keep my own work and it doesn't really matter what people think about it. So what's the solution to that? People go out and buy photo books and actually spend time and money on the work that they enjoy and then they'll slow down and actually take time to absorb it. Yeah. I think working on photo books is pretty cool. I, I mean, if your favorite like contemporary photographer, you only saw like one photo a month or every other month and you were like, they're amazing. And, but that person, you know, two years down the line is like, I'm releasing this 300 page book. You are probably pretty interested in it. What if that same person was posting two photos a day, you wouldn't care about it. You know, there's no reveal to their work. There's, you know, besides just supporting them, which is great too, but it's not as exciting, right? I feel like if you, if you get a helmet Newton book, there's photos that you just, you can't even look up and that's cool. <laughs> you know, there's some mystery to it. Well, one of the things that's kind of circulated from, like you said, from the pandemic that we've gone through is there's a weird little slidey slide thing on Instagram that people have been sharing around pretty constantly. I don't know if it's made as much of an effect in, in your circle as it has with mine seems like every other day someone is posting the same thing which is about how the sort of like you mentioned the rate at which people are expected to produce work is just completely uh, unsustainable with with you know how artists actually work and i think like you look at ryan muirhead uh, as, as much as i absolutely love his work he's a, a great example of how people that have certain demons that they're fighting and they have certain things that they're working through produce amazing art, but you can't rush that process. You can't push that because it's, there's a direct connection between the art and the mental state. And if you keep pushing the art, you're going to keep pushing the mental state. And I, I, you know, I've maybe spent about 40 episodes of the podcast just whining about social media at the beginning, because I just, I'm, I'm 32, but I feel like I'm 60 at this point with how Instagram just constantly changing people's narratives and it's constantly making people pretend more and more that they are something that they're not is is this kind of conveyor belt of art actually just really bad for the artist it's content though right it's not even art anymore they're not making right. it for art it's all content and I'm, i mean whatever for some people maybe it serves a purpose they think they get farther but the less contenty i am and i mean believe me i've never shot content everything i do has purpose to it. But when I feel like even that's kind of contenty, it hasn't gotten me more jobs or farther along. The less I post now, the more I book, you know? So maybe coming up, you feel like you have to do it, but I feel like, you know, there's a point where it's just like, no, you just make the best stuff you can when you want to. And, you know, if you want to share it, that's cool. But yeah, we've gotten lost along the way about like why we're actually doing something. Yeah, I mean, I tend to switch off immediately when someone mentions like working out the algorithm or gaming the algorithm and how they can get, like increase traffic and stuff. <laughs> no one cares. Yeah, no one cares. A fault of us maybe is, you know, we think as photographers that we have to make photography our job, you know. I've, there's like a whole generation of people that think like if they are interested in something, or if it's a hobby, they have to make their hobby a job, right? Like, that's just not the case. And I think like photographers now just think like, oh, it's a job. Is there anybody out there that shoots photos for fun anymore? <laughs> like, is there? It's a good point. It's a good point. I mean, I'm, I'm becoming allergic to the expression content. And especially when it's used in the context of 
content creator because it has a biblical feel to it where people are kind of putting themselves in the position of being a creator, which is a slightly concerning, <laughs> uh, concerning thing for anyone to say. It sounds very sociopathic. Last question, and then, and then we'll, we'll plug you away. We'll make sure that people go and find your work because as I have said on this before, I am trying to make myself into a human algorithm so that people like what I like and then more of that gets produced and I just get what I want out of it. Um, but before we get to that, my last question is obviously the coronavirus has been bad for everybody. I, I literally am on the back of, I had it two weeks ago and there's people obviously that have passed away from it. It's affected a lot of people's health and one thing it has absolutely done is completely ground the, the arts in, in a lot of communities completely to a halt. Um, and it's given a lot of people time to sort of reflect or plan on what they're going to do when they get out. And I feel like there's a big buildup of creative energy that's waiting to just shoot out as soon as, as soon as things open back up. But what was your, what was your process with dealing with the, the, the lockdowns and the, the, the pandemic and not being able to work as much? And then have you planned anything for when you come out of it? Yeah, it, I mean, it was really tough at first because, I, like I said, I used to shoot so often. That was my like reason to be social and you know go on road trips or fly to other cities. And you know that gets taken away, and you can't do anything. And then you're you know sitting there thinking like, uh, I mean, what is my worth if this is my only worth? Which is silly, and I feel like all of us probably felt like that with whatever we're doing. You know, when you break everything down and you're going. Yeah, I mean, I can't do what I love anymore, but, you know, I should still find ways to be happy. But what else makes me happy? And then you're like, what's wrong with me? (laughs) Don't I have other things? So that part was tough. And, you know, working through that, I was lucky that I have a few close friends that are models and like stylists that I, I felt like I could, you know, shoot with like once every other week or once a month. You know, the first three months, I didn't do anything. But after that, you realize that you have to do something. Like <laughs> you have to be out there somewhere. And in to the future, I don't have crazy plans because I'm not one of those people that is like in one month, I'm going to do this concept. I'm like, I'm a person that's like in 48 hours, I'm doing this concept. And it's <laughs> just a real like, you know, I fly by the seat of my pants and I'm a lot of chaos. And, and the people that links up with, we create great stuff. And some people need the structure. I probably stress them out horribly, you know, <laughs> but it's my own process and I, it's not complicated. You know, I just feel it and I go and I do it. All right. So I lied. You've led me to one more question. I'm sorry, but you've mentioned there about being more, you're, you're more of, I guess, more of an improviser and you're someone that works better on the fly. If you were to be like pinned down and, and forced to plan stuff out in advance, do you think that that would dramatically change either the way that you work or the quality of your work? It depends on the structure that people want. Like I'm okay with giving a location and like getting a stylist to like build a look and giving a heads up that way. Anything more than that. I just like how, you know, like how I don't need like a, (laughs) I just don't need somebody to hold my hand. I don't know. Do you ever watch like old French films like that Godard made? Right. Yeah. 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 (laughs) <laughs> he actually would write the lines two minutes before they're shooting on 16 millimeter in the sixties, you know, and it looked great and it's iconic, <laughs> you know? And I feel like, I, you know, like how do you get that rawness by having so much structure? And I just don't think you can. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but when it works, it's wonderful. It's been incredible to talk to you. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Like I said earlier, this is the, the chance where we, I know you don't like the self-promotion. You don't like the limelight on you, but I'm forcing the issue. So we need to tell everyone where they can go to find all of your work. So Instagram, websites, and so on, where can they find you? Yeah, uh, my website is myfridayfilms.com. And I feel like if you get there, you'd find everything you need. (laughs) I do have an Instagram. I, I use it sparingly, but it's somewhat popular. There we go. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. Let them know, I gotta let them know That she my white horse, she my medical She like my baby mom, know how to take care of me Get my baby problems, you gon' regret everything So I let them know, gotta let them know Came through the front door, I'll be ready for And if it's what you want, I'ma give it to you Yeah, promise, I'ma give it to you Miss that smile Lord knows I ain't seen that in a while But it's your style So something must be up keeping you down You a queen that must be heaven sent 
pray my soul I must repent for not telling you what I meant and how I felt Honestly, I'm used to throwing wishes in a well My conscience tells me that I could have helped without fail Actions speak louder than words And that's a lesson that I learned all by myself Like my baby mama know how to take care of me Give my baby problems, you gon' regret everything So I let her know, gotta let her know Came through the front door, I'll be ready for her. And if it's what you want, I'ma give it to you Yeah, promise, I'ma give it to you Stress is all around us, these high ceilings and I need a baby Pressure and make diamonds, I won't steal a baby Silent baby, hurts to see you crying, know you trying Ain't no lying baby, when I say I need you Greedy if I have to share you It was me that all along did you wrong Thinking that I made you beautiful and strong This toxicity, the death of me, I fear the day you gone The most beautiful girl I've ever known, known. I'm a kid.